there is an intelligence of play, a rich and free exploration of relationship, nothing to justify or defend, the feel of a glove, a blade of grass, the sound of a great swing and a child's smile. There is an intelligence of play, a free and expansive exploration and relationship, trust and affection. It's a model of learning and performance we feel will light the way now and into the next century. We invite you to become a part of this vision, to discover and develop this quality in yourself. The intelligence of play, a new model for a new generation of children. James W. Prescott, PhD, is a developmental neuropsychologist and cross-cultural psychologist. Jim has devoted his professional life to the study of peaceful and violent behaviors, focusing specifically on the impact of early mother-infant nurturing and its lifelong impact on the developing brain. He was formerly health science administrator at the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development in Washington, D.C. The intelligence of play is what we're going to be talking about, but what I want to talk about is some of the foundations which is going to make possible or not possible the intelligence of play. Underlying all this is really the, the transformation of human society from one of violence, depression, alienation, to one of peace and harmony and happiness. And that's basically what I think this is all about. Uh, and I have approached those problems as a developmental neuropsychologist and cross-cultural psychologist in examining the beginnings of all this and, and ask a question, how does a society take an innocent newborn and place that newborn on a life path that's characterized by peace and happiness and love and harmony, or the opposite, you know, depression, alienation, anger, rage, violence? And I think that is the most fundamental question of all. And I can certainly say, without any hesitation, that we're not going to find the answer in our genes. So we'll say no more about that. What we have learned over the years, uh, and I've devoted most of my professional life to this, is examining the roots of this in the mother-infant relationship. That the mother-infant relationship is the beginning relationship of all other human relationships, and relationship to society and, and to the planet itself. <coughs> and there's been an enormous amount of research that's been conducted over the past quarter of a century that shows and is documented that the failure of mother love, of affectional bonding in the mother-infant relationship, does induce developmental brain abnormalities, both structurally and functionally. And it's these brain abnormalities that underlie the depression, the alienation, the anger, the rage, the violence. So we do have a large body of, of knowledge, not only from what I've been involved in, but all of you here, that we can bring to bear on this transformation of, of human society is what we're really all about. So let me, let me uh, comment about uh, the good fortune that we recently had by the White House recognizing, finally, uh, the significance of the role in the environment in influencing the child's brain development and behavior. In the recent White House conference on brain-child development behavior that was held last April, this past April 17th. Their focus, as we know, has been on cognitive skills and development, uh, language, math, music. But you heard very little about the other side of, of development which is our emotional, social, and sexual development. No reference to the major breakthroughs that were made over a quarter of a century ago of how the failure of mother love leads to developmental brain abnormalities, specifically of the emotional, social, and sexual brain. And there is, lies most of where our modern uh, problems exist. And I think we can all recognize that uh, a child who has uh, been abused, neglected, who's depressed, who's alienated, who's filled with anger and rage and is violent, is not going to be able to participate in the intelligence of play. The damage has already been done. So what I want to try to focus on and highlight very briefly in, in these few moments that I have is that kind of damage that, that is done. Uh, the sensory systems that we know are involved 
and uh, what we can do for prevention. Now, it is very clear that the sensory uh, environment, the sensory stimuli, is like a nutrient for normal brain development. And if the developing brain doesn't receive adequate sensory stimulation from all of our senses, there's not normal brain growth and development structurally and functionally. Now, when it comes to another infant relationship, there are certain sensory systems that are more important than others. And we discovered that the two most important are body touch and body movement, and particularly body movement. And this is what's going to have a, a, a crucial, uh, a central role uh, for understanding uh, the power of intelligence of play because of that particular sensory system, but others. So when I uh, joined the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development back in the 60s, uh, no one had raised the question of trying to understand these behavioral <laughs> pathologies in terms of abnormal brain processes. It was all social, psychological uh, evaluations, assessment. But it's very, very clear that sensory stimulation is absolutely essential for normal brain, brain growth and development, and particularly as it involves the intimate physical affectional relationship that Mother Nature has provided in the mother-infant relationship. And again, this involves the, the primary senses of, of touch and movement, but also smell. And that, that involves another dimension of behavior of intimacy, uh, the movement uh, stimulation, I feel, uh, which involves uh, the vestibular cerebellar system, and we'll talk more about that later today, uh, conveys, in my sense, the psychological uh, characteristic of basic trust. And this is conveyed by the mother carrying the infant on the body of the mother throughout the day. That's, incidentally, the primary sensory input during fetal development is, is movement. And then touch for affectional uh, relating and bonding. Uh, they're all, of course, interrelated, but these are, I think, some basic psychological characteristics that flow from these, these sensory systems. Unless we pay attention to those very first, earlier stages of development, the newborn infant mother relationship and to assure the normal development of the brain, uh, we are going to have enormous difficulty in instituting programs of this kind because, again, the damage has already been done. Now, in addition to the sensory processes that are associated with nurturance and bonding and the basic trust and love and all that goes with it, there is also the, the very extraordinary importance of breastfeeding and breast milk. And I just want to mention this very briefly to indicate how important that mother-infant relationship is. That what we have discovered in, in a variety of studies is that there's a certain brain neurotransmitter called serotonin, brain serotonin, which we know when deficit of brain serotonin exists is associated with depression, impulse discontrol, and pathological violence. And I initiated some of those earlier studies with the, the animals, the, the mother-deprived animals. But that relationship is very well uh, established with adult human violent individuals, both homicidal and suicidal. So there's no question about that relationship. Now, the implication back to breastfeeding. Uh, human breast milk can, contains an enormous uh, amount of nutrients and biochemical factors not present in formula milk. One of the critical elements is tryptophan which is an amino acid, a precursor amino acid, essential for the development of brain serotonin. So when the newborn infant is not breastfed, the brain is deprived of that critical nutrient that makes the normal development of the brain serotonin system possible. So we have now two independent, quote, independent sources that influence the developing brain that we know results in alterations and abnormalities that are linked to later depression, impulse, discontrol, and violence. So one of the priorities that our society, any human society, must have if we're going to begin this reconstruction is to support women as nurtured mothers. And we have not been doing that, uh, particularly with respect to breastfeeding. And the World Health Organization has recommended two years and beyond for breastfeeding. Now, this is very foreign to our culture, and I get a lot of negative reactions from women. What, breastfeed for two years and beyond? But when you examine what really happens 
And you talked, and there are a number of women actually who breastfeed not only two years, but three, four, five years. La Leche League International has a number of these, these families. Uh, what you find is a, a bonding and an intimacy that develops, which involves all the sensory systems, touch and movement and smell. And when you encode that developing brain over a two-year period or longer, I will guarantee you, you will have a child who will develop to be happy and can relate intimately with women and not in an exploitive, violent manner. At the Hazelton Laboratories in Falls Church, Virginia, these normal monkeys are being studied and filmed by Dr. James Prescott of the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Active, curious, and alert, these healthy monkeys have been raised by their mothers. When they are put together in a cage, they react to each other with interest. They are at ease with each other. They play and touch each other freely. When Dr. Prescott separates the monkeys, they resist, holding each other tightly. They maintain body contact and cling to each other, even through the wire mesh of their cages. Monkeys raised in isolation behave quite differently. These monkeys were removed from their mothers at birth. They were hand-fed and incubators. They were raised in cages through which they could see, hear, and smell other monkeys, but could not touch or be touched by them. When they are put together, there is no play between them. They seem indifferent to touch. Or they react as though touch is unpleasant and move away from each other. When they are held, the isolation-reared monkeys show signs of great stress, screeching and baring their teeth. Dr. A.J. Berman observes the extreme aggressiveness and hypersensitivity to touch of these hollow monkeys raised in isolation. After the cage barrier is removed, the monkeys stalk each other. The moment they touch, they are driven to a violent attack. Isolation-reared monkeys are frequently observed biting and chewing away at their own limbs, a phenomenon frequently observed in mentally ill humans as well. The stereotype movements of rocking backwards and forwards, over and over again, are typical of animals deprived of normal mothering. It is as though the animals attempt to give themselves the touch and motion stimuli they were denied in infancy. Similar behaviors in maternally deprived children, rocking and other stereotype movements, are common symptoms observed in institutionalized children all over the world. Some children who engage in stereotype movement, endlessly repeated, show evidence of brain damage. Stereotypical movements are observed in retarded children as well. All these children have been deprived of normal mothering for one reason or another and display the same emotional and social impairment and stereotype movements as animals raised in isolation.